Hello, everybody. Yeah. Very happy to have Juana Pamelo here. Um, she did her master's and undergrad at EPFL in Switzerland. And now she's doing her PhD in the uh, University of Sydney in Australia uh, with Willy Zwanov. And she'll tell us about her work, how to reduce latency spikes in key value stores, right latency spikes. And her work received the best paper award yesterday. And thanks for stopping by. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, thank you for the introduction. Hi, everyone. It's really nice to see you here and to visit Microsoft. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm Anna from the University of Sydney. And uh, today I'm going to present Silk, a system uh, for preventing latency spikes in log structure merge key value stores, or LSMs in short. This is joint work with Florin Dinu and Willy Svanopol, my advisor, the University of Sydney, Karan Gupta and Ravi Chandiramurthy from Nutanix, and Diego Didona from IBM Research. So, okay, maybe uh, I can uh, briefly go through this, but the introduction uh, said it. Um, I did my bachelor and master's at EPFL. My interests um, in research are uh, around storage systems, distributed systems, concurrency and uh, parallelism. And uh, during my PhD, I've done uh, a few internships uh, at Nutanix in uh, the Bay Area and in Bangalore. HP Vertica in Boston, and uh, ABB Research in uh, Switzerland. So let's begin. Our topic for today is uh, log structure merge key value stores, which are um, uh, key value stores designed for high throughput in uh, write heavy workloads. They can handle uh, large amounts of data, and they're typically used when the working set doesn't fit in main memory. Some good examples of popular um, Popular LSM key value stores are Cassandra or uh, Google's LevelDB, Facebook's RocksDB. So LSMs claim to uh, optimize uh, for uh, write-heavy workloads, but is this really the case? One thing we noticed when we run a Nutanix write-intensive production workload in RocksDB was that the latency presented really large latency spikes. So this plot shows um, the 99th percentile latency on the y-axis as a function of time on the x-axis, so uh, lower is better. And we can see that the latency spikes up to one second in uh, a write-dominated workload. And these spikes are up to three orders of magnitude higher than the median tail latency. This, uh, this isn't a really... Um, um, this, is an, this is an important problem uh, for two reasons. First of all, if we have unpredictable performance, uh, it's uh, difficult to provide uh, SLA guarantees to clients. And second, also this unpredictable performance makes it uh, difficult to connect LSMs in larger pipelines and systems. So our contribution is uh, the Silk LSM Key Value Store. It's a system that solves the latency spike problem for write-heavy workloads without having um, negative side effects for other workloads. And uh, Silk does so by introducing the notion of an I.O. scheduler for LSM key value stores. Now, this talk will be structured into two parts. First, I'd like to um, present an experimental study that tries to understand the reason behind these latency spikes. And then in the second part of the talk, I will be, um, I will be um, presenting our solution. So, broadly, what causes these lat latency spikes? We found that it's the severe competition for I.O. bandwidth between client operations and LSM internal operations, which uh, well, we can uh, essentially see as uh, garbage collection. But I will uh, explain this in a lot more detail uh, in the talk. So to get a bit of context, I'd like to, uh, to show you the structure of an LSM key value store. The, um, the LSMs are structured into two. We have a memory component called the write buffer and a disk component. The disk component is structured in uh, several levels, each of the levels containing a number of files. These files are immutable, and they're so sorted, and they're called SS tables. As far as client operations go, the updates are absorbed in the memory component, and the reads traverse the levels of the LSM tree one by one until the desired key value tuple is found. In addition to um, client operations, we also have internal operations. 
And uh, here I'm going to get into uh, some pretty uh, involved explanation of the LSM internal operations, so bear with me. We have uh, three types of internal operations. There's slashing, there's level zero to level one compaction, and uh, higher level compactions. An important thing to remember is that uh, in state-of-the-art uh, LSMs, there's no coordination between internal operations. So let's, um, let's look at each of these uh, more closely. We have uh, flashing that happens when the write buffer is full. So the write buffer turns into a flash buffer, which is uh, written to level zero of the disk component, while a new empty write buffer is installed in order to absorb the updates. The second uh, internal operation is level zero to level one compaction. This essentially merges one level zero SS table with the SS tables in uh, level one. Thus, it makes room for, um, for flashing on level zero. And by the way, if at any point there are questions, just feel free to interrupt. Don't wait until the end. Yes. What SM stands for? Log structure merge. The third type of internal operations are uh, higher level compactions. These, um, these are the compactions that um, are uh, playing the role of garbage collection in the LSM tree. And uh, they're discarding duplicates and uh, deleting uh, values. These compactions are less urgent than uh, level zero to level one compactions in terms of uh, how relevant they are to um, the impact on uh, client stay latency. But they still need to complete. They're also IO bandwidth intensive, and also we can have many higher level compactions running in parallel. Now to, uh, to review, we have three types of internal operations in LSMs. We have flashing from memory to disk, level zero to level one compaction, which makes room to flash new files, and higher level compactions, which are uh, similar to garbage collection, and they are IO intensive. Also, there's no coordination between internal operations and client operations, and no coordination between internal operations between themselves. Now that we know this, what causes LSM latency spikes? And I'd like to, uh, to mention that both reads and writes experience latency spikes in our measurements, but I'm going to focus uh, the explanation on writes because I think it's more interesting, it's less intuitive, the writes finish in memory, right? So um, then why are we seeing uh, one second latency spikes? This is what we set out to, um, to um, figure out. And uh, we found two types of scenarios, which I'm going to illustrate with some examples. The first is that uh, you, we cannot flush. So we take again the LSM schema here we are trying to flash, uh, to write the flash buffer to level zero, but for, uh, in this situation, level zero is full. So there is, no, um, there is no space to write. This means that the write buffer will fill up and eventually there will be, um, the writes will have to be blocked because there is no more space to write in memory. So more precisely, the root cause is no coordination between internal operations. This leads uh, to the higher level <coughs> compactions taking over the IO bandwidth. This makes level zero to level one compaction too slow and leading to not enough space on L0, leading to not being able to flash the memory component, leading to the writes being blocked. So what triggers the flashing? When the, whenever the memory component gets full, the flash is triggered. Are there flashes for durability? Um, oh, right, so not you could you could enforce it, but in this case, uh, it's only when uh, when the memory component gets full. Uh, if you want more dur uh, durability guarantees, you can use the commit log. Yes. Let's can go back to the uh, hierarchy. Uh, so for this yep. disk hierarchy, is the uh, level, a logical level, lo logical separation, or is it, is it a physical from L0 to L30? 
the SSD separation? Um, it's logical. Okay. So yes, on the SSD, it's just a bunch of files. So then the next obvious question from that, why is there a fixed amount of space allocated to L0? Mm. I mean, here you're assuming that you've exhausted space on L0, but the implication is there's still other space available which you will need in order to do subsequent mm. actions. So, uh, well, I will talk, uh, I will talk about uh, the next scenario which, um, in which writes block even if you have enough space on L0. This is something... Um, so from what, from what I could tell in RocksDB, uh, the, the limit on, on size of levels is, uh, is more like a safety, um, um, a way of, uh, for RocksDB to control um, its flow. So basically, if level zero gets full, you kind of assume that um, you're receiving more load that you can handle. So it's kind of um, an artificial limit. But this can be set to infinity, so it doesn't. Uh, but even if it's set to infinity, we will see that it's still it's still a problem. Hmm. So, so they don't try to repurpose areas that have been assigned to L2, L1, L2, L3, even when they're having trouble flushing. Uh, no, no. It's um, right, cause if it's the same device, they can just call a slot in L1, L0 from L. Yes, you could, you could do that. Uh, there's, there's no issue in doing that. I think it's more of a workflow um, management yeah. decision. So I also have um, the same situation explained um, in terms of what happens to the I.O. bandwidth. So we're looking here at the timeline of the internal operations in the um, LSM tree. We have the flashing in blue, and then the higher level compactions in green, and then this slow level zero to level one compaction. And this isn't, um, this isn't like a, a fake example. It's something that we actually noticed when running RocksDB in like real, uh, the real uh, production workload. Maybe a bit simplified, but... Uh, so the, the I.O. operations, are they sort of large chunks that cannot be broken up into... Mm. Uh, smaller pieces so that other sort of more important requests can... They can be broken up, but uh, at the moment they aren't. And uh, this is where our solution will come in, actually. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, uh, in the state-of-the-art uh, LSMs, there's no preemption of uh, flashes or compactions. And no priorities. And no priorities. So basically, uh, whenever the LSM deems that it's necessary to do some compaction or some flash, it just does it. And it doesn't care about uh, other <laughs> things that are, might be happening in the system, like client operations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, but like this is exactly where I'm going to. <laughs> yeah. So, in in this example, say for some reason, which is not enough I/O bandwidth, the um, the level zero to level one compaction is uh, slow, and uh, writes keep coming. Level zero. Um, is being full with this third flush here. I mean, it doesn't have to be three. It can be whatever number um, is uh, set for the maximum size of L0. But if there is no more space on L0, the flushes will be blocked. So eventually, the latency will spike because uh, we cannot flush. Now, the second case, which uh, is uh, more to your point, is that the flashing is slow. So in this situation, similar to uh, the previous example, but now there is enough space to flash on level zero. So um, we can proceed. However, it's possible to get really unlucky and have a situation in which many of the higher level parallel compactions are running. So um, what happens is that the amount of bandwidth that is given to, the, to write the flash buffer to level zero will be really, um, really low. And uh, this can cause the write buffer to fill up before, before the flash buffer has a chance to get written to disk. And then the updates as a result would, get, uh, would also get throttled. So um, the root cause, again, is this lack of coordination between internal operations that leads to higher level compactions taking over the I.O. The flash doesn't have enough I.O., so it becomes very slow, so the memory component Will, uh, will become full. So I, I think 
you explained this, but I, I missed. What exactly is a compaction? A compaction? What are you doing to the data? A compaction um, from level I to level I plus one is taking one file from level one, uh, level I, picking all the files that have overlapping key ranges with it from level I plus one, reading everything into memory, merging the file from level I into the files from level I plus one, and writing everything back. Oh, I see. So the files are essentially sets of writes, and you're doing a merge and seeing what got overwritten. So That's where the merge... So basically, on level zero here, we have um, the, file, the, the files are just the copies of the write buffer. But as we, co as we go down the levels, we will have the property that, um, well, all the files are sorted, and uh, there, are no disjoint, there are disjoint key ranges between the files. So it's not exactly a collection of writes. It's, it's a more ordered collection of writes. Yes. What's the difference between L1 and L2? Like, L0 and L1 is different because mm -hmm. L0 is just the flush buffer, but L1 and L2 are different. And no, the, the difference is, uh, well, it's the size. And um, I mean, this is an interesting observation because I was wondering about it myself when I started looking into this. Why, why do we need three levels or four levels? Why not just have one? <laughs> um, and um, it's because uh, we want to amortize the cost of, um, of doing all these rewrites um, during, uh, during the compaction. Imagine if you had just like one big level underneath and you would want to merge what you're writing uh, from memory then your, your compaction or your merge would touch all of the files. So every time you want to write something new, you would have to um, rewrite everything to disk. This kind of hierarchical way makes it that um, the really low level writes, which are bigger, become uh, um, occur less often. Okay, it's sort of a cache of sorts. Or... Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just uh, to have the expensive operations done okay. less often. Because here is where you will have most of the most of the work. I'm getting back to yes. So again, the same the same scenario, but illustrated from the I/O bandwidth perspective. We are in this very unlucky situation, which kind which happens quite often, where. Um, where we have many uh, higher level compactions running in parallel, taking over the bandwidth, which causes a flash to uh, become a lot slower than expected, which will cause the, the latency to spike. So these are the two main reasons that we, um, uh, that we found for um, writes becoming blocked. Now, what can we do about it? A first solution that's, um, that exists with many um, LSM stores like uh, RocksDB is to provide a compaction rate limiter. So uh, you allocate a fixed amount of bandwidth to perform these internal operations. Um, this is a simple attempt to coordinate between internal and external operations, but um, this plot shows that it's not very efficient in the long term. So again, the latency is on the y-axis, uh, the 99th percentile latency and the time is on the um, x-axis. So even though it might seem that uh, that uh, compaction uh, rate limiter solves the problem, if you run the experiment long enough, um, the chance to run many high-level compactions in parallel will increase. So um, it's not um, just statically ra uh, rate limiting uh, bandwidth isn't a good solution in the long term. So, so you're yes. only limiting the, 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 the run rate, uh, for the rate for the compaction, not the rate for the flush. So, um, well, it depends on the, on the implementation. In this case, it's just the compaction for RocksDB. That's the default. Yes. Yes, the flush has, um, uh, is not affected by the rate limiting. In this case. <laughs> yes. Then the second solution, um, broadly, is to delay or to be selective about how you're doing compactions. So here I have um, two examples 
triad from um, from Musnix uh, 2017 and Pebbles DB from SOSP 2017. Uh, these systems are trying to um, select which compactions they uh, they perform or to uh, to try to delay the compactions a little. Both systems are using different flavors of the same same main idea. And again, it might seem that this solution works, but if you run the experiment long enough, you will see that eventually the latency spikes. And um, this is because you eventually need to do the compaction work. You can't, uh, uh, you can't uh, keep postponing it forever. So uh, when it's time to catch up with the, um, with the delayed work, uh, you run into the same I/O bandwidth sharing problem as uh, as in the beginning. This leads us to three lessons that we learned from the from the study. First, we should ensure that level zero is uh, never full, so we can flush. Second, we should ensure that there's sufficient bandwidth for uh, flushing and the uh, and for the compactions on the low level levels of the tree. And by low levels, I mean uh, the ones that are closer to the memory component. And third, we should make sure that uh, the higher level compactions don't fall behind too much so that the strategy is uh, going to work in the long term. And this leads me to uh, the Silk IO scheduler, our contribution. So the main idea in Silk is to introduce the IO scheduler in uh, LSM key value stores. And uh, by doing this, we'll coordinate the IO bandwidth sharing to minimize interference between the internal operations and the client operations. And the, Silk, um, um, the Silk scheduler has uh, three main, uh, three main uh, design principles, but it can also be extended to have more, depending on what you need. In the first, um, from the first lesson learned, making sure that level zero is never full, we uh, prioritize internal operations at the lower level of, of the tree to ensure that we have sufficient IO bandwidth for flashing and compactions on the low levels. We are going to preempt the higher level compactions if that's necessary. And uh, to make sure that uh, the other compactions don't fall behind too much, we will opportunistically allocate IO for higher, higher level compactions. Now, how do we do this exactly? I'm going to talk about the first two principles together, so prioritize and preempt. The, the way Silk sets priorities for the internal operations in, um, in the LSM tree are to have flushing as the first priority, level zero to level one compactions as the second priority, and then the higher level compactions as the lowest priority. We do this by having a dedicated flush queue, and then we allow level zero to level one compaction to preempt the higher level compactions. And we can look at a simple example. So in this case, we have um, a flash thread and a maximum uh, three par parallel compaction threads. Let's say that we're in a case where the system is running. We have a flash, a few of the higher level compactions. And um, Let's say that uh, one uh, level zero to level one compaction is, um, is being scheduled. So instead of placing it in one of the queues, we are going to pick one of the higher level compactions, preempt it, place it, um, place it back in one of the queues, and allow the level zero to level one compaction to execute. In this way, the level zero to level one compactions never wait behind the higher level compactions. And also an interesting point, I think, is to, uh, to note that there can only be one level zero to level one compaction at a time. So we can't, um, we can't end up in a situation where um, level zero to level one compactions are starving the other compactions. This is because, uh, this is because of consistency reasons. So whenever we want to merge a level zero file into level one, because on level zero, each file can have all of the, um, uh, potentially can have all of the key range, but on level one, key ranges are disjoint between the files. Um, what typically happens is that uh, a merge between, a compaction between a level zero file and a level one file ends up touching most of the level one files. So um, you can't have, 
you can have several of these uh, level zero to level one compactions running in parallel. Yes. So, silly question. Why does it not make sense to read in two L0 trees and merge them to L1 at the same time? So, um, to split level zero into two? So my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, but all of those L0 ranges could cover any conceivable key space. They're internally sorted, but they're mm -hmm. also overlapping because they're just what yes. came out of the memory yes. table. Yes. So if you've got two tables that both cover the mm -hmm. entire key range, wouldn't it make sense to merge them at that time when compacting mm -hmm. with L1, so you only need to rewrite L1 once rather than twice? So this is something that we do in uh, one of the um, uh, previous work in Triad. Uh, and uh, it helps for write amplification. Um, we actually implemented Silk on top of Triad as well, and we, we see that uh, the techniques help to reduce the latency spikes. But yes, it's a good point. Like it's, a, it's a worthwhile thing to do. The problem that you can run into if you wait too long, so maybe if you take two files, it's fine, but if you take, I don't know, 10 files, then it would take longer to do the merge. An interesting optimization that, um, that is running in RocksDB right now is to have uh, these level zero to level zero compactions, which just mm, merge, merge the files and still leave them on level zero, which uh, helps, but uh, I mean, essentially, essentially um, if you have um, a restriction on, uh, on the IO bandwidth, then it's still a matter of how you allocate the resources. So you can make level zero to level zero compaction to have higher priority. Or you can try to make some optimization for this kind of compaction. But uh, yes, probably can also use more techniques together. Mm. So when you talk about a merge L0 to L0 of compaction between the same level, are you talking about a resizing the, 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 the same level? Yes. Yeah, because it seems natural. The first problem is you want to keep the L0 big enough at any time. So maybe a natural idea is to resize everything. So have you tried dynamically resizing all the different levels? By dynamically resizing, you mean to allocate more? Yeah, uh, yeah. Like when you, your 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 system monitors that mm -hmm. the L zero is almost full, mm -hmm. then you give it more space from uh, this kind of techniques. Mm, we didn't try that. No, what we did try was to uh, set the limits for the levels to be uh, really high, so that so that uh, it's very unlikely to run into this uh, level limit problem. Okay. But essentially, um, it, it all boils down to sharing the IO bandwidth. In, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter like, what size of level you have. And uh, it's just if, if, uh, if someone uh, is taking over the IO bandwidth and it's not letting the flashes to proceed, then you will get uh, these, uh, these latency spikes. Okay. Yes? Uh, so it seems like uh, the way you schedule the compaction request is more kind of uh, re reactive in the mm -hmm. sense that once a compaction is triggered, you're going to schedule them. Mm -hmm. Would that also make sense to see uh, whether you can do it more like um, proactive in the way that if you see there is a potential that this level is going to um, get being compacted very soon, you start mm -hmm. doing that instead of doing lower level, because that level will affect the actual mm -hmm. the right um, latency. This, um, I mean, the third technique that, uh, that we have in Silk is, in a sense, uh, more, uh, more proactive. Uh, but it's not what you're saying. So what you're uh, suggesting is, uh, is it's different. It's more like identify the yeah. critical path and try to re first, you want like preventive scheduling something ahead of time. I think in LSMs anyway, when you're starting to check what compactions need to be done, you start checking from the, um, from the levels that are closer to the memory component downwards. Uh -huh. So if you identify that oh, there's right. a need to do compaction, you would, uh, you would trigger that first. But still, it, it's not what you're saying because... Yeah, so you, like, give, give, give you an example. Assume level two is not full. Yes. 
but level three is writing to level four, it's trigger compaction. Mm -hmm. Now, if you see level one is close to four, instead of uh, finishing the level three to level four compaction, it might make sense to proactively compact some mm -hmm. from level one to level two. It might affect yeah. the power of the I think this could be a nice extension. I mean, what we're doing here with this level zero to level one compaction, preempting some other less important compaction, I think this kind of uh, prioritization or hierarchy of importance of compactions can be uh, also sent down yeah. to the other levels. We didn't implement it, okay. but I, I mean, I don't see a reason uh, yeah. why. Uh, it's more like a different prioritizing. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the scheduler it can be extended with um, with more policies or different policies, also depending on what bottleneck you have. Mm -hmm. Yes, but we we actually thought about it, but then we didn't implement it. <laughs> yes. So then the the third technique, which is more of a proactive instead of reactive, if you want, is uh, to uh, opportunistically allocate the I/O bandwidth for compaction, and this. Um, this technique uh, was inspired by, um, uh, by noticing that in real client loads at Nutanix, the workload isn't constant. So um, the, um, the client workload looks, um, can look a bit like this, with these peaks and valleys not staying at the same amount uh, of bandwidth uh, all the time. So in Silk, we continuously monitor this client I.O. bandwidth use, and we're trying to take advantage of this pattern. So we will allocate less I.O. to compactions during the client peaks and more I.O. during uh, the low load, as uh, we can see uh, in this plot with the, um, with the red line, which shows the internal operations I.O., and the blue line that shows the, the client I.O. So can you recall what is the application that generated this workload? So it was a bit uh, unclear. Uh, the, um, Mm. Nutanix uses a SEM key value source to run the metadata, um, to, to handle the metadata. But then the load itself from the clients was anonymous. So all we could see was the um, amounts of reads and writes and the fluctuations, the amounts of requests. And the storage, is it SSD or hard drives? It's SSD. And, um, and the experiments were run, this is, uh, yes, this is a good point, uh, were run on one SSD. So it's one machine, one SSD. And that's a simple, simple setting. And the, the workload essentially is metadata operations, so yep. there aren't very large writes. Mm, they're medium size. So in the production workload, we had uh, the average size was 400 bytes for key value tuples. And then it would range. So uh, most of them were around this size or, or smaller. But then you would also have um, larger, um, larger operations, like uh, uh, a few kilobytes. But n nothing huge. Really? Mm. Uh, so smaller than 4K? Yeah. yeah. Then you also have scans, which are larger. But in terms of writes, the writes are uh, fairly small. The scans can be, well, mm. And sometimes you have scans that go for the whole range. But what would they be issued as a single read operation or Yes, multiple? it's, a, it's a, a range query operation, yes. But this doesn't, they don't really interfere with, uh, with what we're talking about uh, here. Because they happen during these periods of more load? Um, why, don't, why don't they interfere? No, I meant they wouldn't interfere with the with the compaction um, running because. But it's extra load on on the SSD, right? It is extra load. Yes, I think compared to the compaction load, it's not uh, as big. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. So basically, what we're trying to achieve here with giving more I/O to high-level compactions during low load is to try to opportunistically do as much compaction as we can when we have the available resources and hopefully we won't fall behind. Also, even in these peak loads, we want to guarantee some minimum IO bandwidth for flashing and for level zero to level one operations, so we don't want to completely stop those because we would rather have the clients running a bit slower but um, 
making sure that the operations that are critical to avoid these latency spikes um, are, are still getting done. And, and how do you determine that now is a good time to increase the amount of um, I.O. bandwidth for uh, compactions? So there is a monitoring spread that looks at the load, the client. It's, um, uh, there's a parameter that sets um, the granularity of... Uh, so if, if there's been no load for this amount of time, then start doing it or something like that? It's, uh, yes, yes. It's, it's pretty reactive. Mm. And, uh, we based on idleness from the It's based side. on idleness. What we have is that if the, if the load of the client fluctuates uh, by a little bit, we won't, uh, we won't detect that it's a value or, uh, I mean, we, don't, we wouldn't detect the, the change. So we are trying to have a little bit of, um, um, to be a bit conservative yeah. with how, how often we make these changes. And then, and then when you start to see load again from the client, then you... Then you immediately, sort of you reduce, immediately the, reduce. Okay. Yes. yes. So it's more like in the direction, we favor the client. Yeah. Yeah. And um, actually, using these uh, standard rate limiters provided in RocksDB, we saw that uh, they're, uh, they're pretty reactive. So if you say you throttle the bandwidth, then it happens. Uh, there's, no, there's no lag. So but there. what happens to uh, compactions that have already started when you decide to bring down the, so the, the... The bandwidth? Yeah, the bandwidth. That is the, the, the red line, right? Yes, so when you decide to bring down the red line, they will just go slower. It's, um, so the so they, they still run until they complete, but you just won't start new ones. But those that have already started complete. Uh, no, so everything is scheduled as before. Uh, we are starting even new operations. It's just, um, it's just that the total amount of bandwidth that we allocate for all of the compactions that want to run will be smaller. We keep a chunk for these uh, urgent compactions, so flashing and level zero yeah. to level one compactions are a bit of a special case. But the other ones, we can schedule as, as, many, as many as we want. The level of parallelism is given by the amount of, um, of uh, background threads in Rock so, TV. So the way you regulate that is by reducing the number of threads that do compaction, well, or the number of queues, I guess. That, yes, yes. And that we set from the beginning, and um, we don't uh, we don't change the number of queues. That that's set from the beginning. It's just that we don't allow an extremely high number of compactions to run in parallel. We noticed uh, actually in the paper um, I mentioned that if you leave too many compactions, uh, if you allow them to run in parallel, as it's actually it's uh, recommended in the Brock's DB tuning guide. Um, you would end up having a lot of uh, parallel compactions running for a very long time because none of them has enough right. resources to finish. So what we do is to uh, limit that quite a lot. So I think we run uh, four maximum in parallel. So uh, the ones that do run at least have a chance to finish more or less on time. Hmm. Yes. So let's move on to, uh, to the evaluation. Um, I'll, uh, I'll present the implementation of Silk on top of RocksDB. And if you're curious, the project is open source. So first, I'd like to show you the YCSB benchmark. We use this because it has uh, different types of workloads, uh, write intensive, read intensive, scan dominated as well. And uh, the goal here is to show that for write dominated workloads, Silk reduces stay latency, and then for the other types of workloads, silk doesn't hurt. This plot shows the 99th percentile latency on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, it shows the six core YCSB workloads. We have silk in blue and RocksDB in red. And we can, uh, we can see that in the two write-dominated workloads, silk um, decreases the latency by up to four orders of magnitude. And in the rest of the workloads, Silk doesn't have uh, a large effect. Moving on to the, to the median latency, this plot shows uh, the same uh, six YCSB core workloads. Um, and uh, 
we can see that uh, Silk is maintaining the median latency pretty much, uh, pretty much the same across the board. Now, uh, to go to a more uh, realistic scenario, we uh, took the Nutanix production workload, which is write dominated, so it's um, around 60% writes. It's bursty in the same style as I uh, mentioned before, so we have the peaks and valleys in the client load. And uh, as far as uh, size is concerned, we have uh, uh, 500 gigabytes trace with uh, uh, 500 gigabytes of, uh, of data with uh, 400 bytes on average uh, for a tuple. But the key, the key value uh, size distribution uh, isn't uh, fixed. So in the case of YCSB, the tuples have a fixed size to uh, 1K. And here, it was more, uh, um, um, it was varied. So this is the same plot that I showed in the beginning of the talk for RocksDB with the big latency spikes. But this time, we also have silk in blue um, on the bottom uh, side of the slide. And we can see that uh, silk maintains the latency, um, the, the latency low and uh, decreases uh, the latency spikes that we noticed in RocksDB. Yes. At the beginning of the talk, we showed a few figures in the tables DD of Riot. Mm -hmm. Run them long enough to yes. see the spikes. Yes. Are there spikes to run this in visual? Um, Is there a reason why Zed will not have spikes? So, it will be slow. Okay, this was our uh, long running experiment <laughs> for Silk in the production workload for 24 hours. It looked it looked very stable for, uh, for uh, even the, the long run. And the reason, the reason why it doesn't have spikes, I think, um, is given, uh, well, it's given by the techniques, but also of the nature of the workload, which allows enough time of this idleness in the client load uh, to, uh, to be able to catch up with the compactions. Triad and Pebbles DB don't take advantage of this time. So when the client load uh, is low, they, they just, uh, they aren't being proactive. Yes, so, um, I mean, we can, uh, yes, let's, the talk is flowing in this direction. Um, one thing I wanted to point out, this is a breakdown of Silk. So, um, well, the bottom is uh, the entire system. Then the top is only the opportunistic allocation of bandwidth. And then uh, in the middle, we have only the preemption and, um, uh, and the different prioritization for uh, internal operations. And we can see that, I mean, both of them help, but you have to do it together. So it's not enough to just be opportunistic about, uh, about how you run compactions. You also need to uh, be able to prioritize what's more important. And and the other way around. So being opportunistic when, when the client load is low is the second Being opportunistic second is the first one. Being opportunistic is the first one. And the preemption and the priorities is the, the second one. Yes? Just a question about the first one, because uh, it seems that you are doing I.O. scheduling, but you are not reduced total amount of I.O. that needs to happen. For yes, right? that's correct. So if this is the case, in the first case, uh, you are still utilizing the same amount of I.O. Mm -hmm. available as the last mm -hmm. one, right? Why there will be, like, um, after a while, there will always be high uh, latency? I, I, was, I would expect there will be, like, something like a spike, and mm -hmm. after a while it becomes low, and then... Uh, well, these are spikes, so maybe the plot is a bit misleading. So, uh, if if the latency would have stayed high, the line would have been uh, just uh, um, like we wouldn't see this uh, like uh, large. Okay, this is a way the right? Yeah. Um, and uh, also, I think um, I think the reason why it spikes once and then it kind of keeps spiking forever. It's because the system is already uh, out of balance. Okay. You can never catch up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's uh, kind of 
the point the point uh, we wanted to make here was that uh, you, you really you need both yes um, another another interesting uh, detail is that um, in the in the production workload experiment we measured uh, the amount of uh, time spent stalling by rocksdb and uh, by silk and we can see that uh, rocksdb spends almost 5% of the time that the benchmark was running stalling um, stalling the writes which uh, is quite uh, quite significant well silk because it's able to flush but all the time it's uh, it never stalls mm. I think these are all of the results that I had uh, for today. Yes, this was supposed to be the, to, the grand uh, ending. Just for, uh, clarification. Yes. So, uh, what is the parameter of uh, the maximum size of L zero? Your experiments. How many SSC will you tolerate before you stop flashing? Mm. Actually, we set it to infinity. Then, Rust, mm -hmm. well, then why? Uh, okay, the the main problem for Rocks TV is just that the flash speed is is too low sometimes. Yes. So I noticed RocksDB has an option. It's basically it allows you to control the priority for different uh, different IOs for like uh, flashes and compactions. So I, mm -hmm. I assume you're not using that feature. In your yes. right? So um, for the implementation, we are relying a bit on that feature, but that that feature isn't. Uh, I mean, it wasn't allowing us to fully express what we wanted to do. So the feature can give high priority to compaction, yes. for example, but it doesn't say that. You only flash. Um, sorry, high priority to flash, but it doesn't say that you only flash using one thread. Okay. So, I mean, uh, we did use many of uh, RocksDB's mechanism when when we implemented Silk, and I think, like, uh, yes, a lot of it was already there. It wasn't just it wasn't used okay. in uh, this way. Mm. So, uh, yeah. judging by your results. Um, I guess the, the scenario where your system just won't be able to control the tail latency is uh, when the client is essentially active like a substantial amount of the time. Yes, yes. So um, actually, I'm not, I didn't show it today, but in the paper we have, uh, we vary the amount of, uh, the, the length of the peaks in the client load, and we start with small small peaks and then synthetically we, we lengthen them and at the end we have this long peak experiment which just basically has the client load running at the uh, highest throughput uh, for as long as it can and eventually eventually it's, it will spike. So what is the threshold utilization of the client where beyond that point your system can no longer catch up? Mm. Do you have a sense for That's a good question. We didn't measure it, no. It's a system capacity issues. Yeah. No, no, she's not going to be able to catch up even before the system capacity. And if we give too many writes, for example, writes bandwidth would be higher than the SSD write bandwidth. In, in, in fact, I can probably cook, I can cook up an example yes. where Silk is not able to catch up, even at very low load. I just spread my accesses Mm. sort of perfectly in time so that they never get to start the compactions opportunistically, right? It I can do that with 10% load even. A malicious, uh, yeah. a malicious user. In <laughs> would practice that wouldn't happen, but yes. it's easy to make that happen. I think if you know, if you know what the parameters of silk yeah. are, you can, you can engineer some yeah. examples. Just so that yes. uh, it won't be able to catch up. What we did was to try, like, Increasingly longer peaks to see uh, how long uh, this kind of peak and valley pattern is sustainable. We didn't try with very short ones yeah. to see. I mean, the short ones were 10 seconds, which is uh, quite long. I mean, it's enough time yeah. for uh, for the system to react because the granularity for measurement was uh, in the order of uh, tens of milliseconds. Yeah. So if you have a few accesses every second, for example. Probably won't be able it to might, keep up. Yes, it might confuse the the system. Yes. Mm. Yes. So um, this is uh, this is it from me. We um, uh, we introduced uh, the concept of an IO scheduler for LSMs with Silk, 
And the idea is to coordinate IO sharing to avoid latency spikes. And by doing so, we noticed up to uh, three orders of magnitude improvement for tail latency in production workloads at Nutanix. Yes, thank you. So, are there any more questions?